wait a minute, we're not suffering. Remember, suffering is up to you. It's up to your activities. It's up to your consciousness. You don't have to suffer. Pain is inevitable. Pain is going to happen. In the material world, there's pleasure and then there's pain. And one comes and then it goes and the other one comes and then it goes and then the other one comes back again. Like that. It's the material world. Pleasure, then pain. Pleasure, pain. Pleasure, pain. Sometimes they're mixed. So pleasure and pain are going to be there. Uh, but suffering is optional. Suffering is an attitude of resisting pain. When you resist pain, you suffer. When you just accept it as an experience, then you don't suffer. Especially if you can see that you are separate from your body and mind, then you don't suffer because those changes in the material world have nothing to do with you. Oh, the soul is eternal, never changes. We can only know that uh, pure consciousness of the soul when we're in relationship with Krishna. Krishna is the central point uh, by which we calibrate our spiritual consciousness. Without consciousness of Krishna, there is no really uh, spiritual consciousness. Some people claim to be developing spiritual consciousness in some impersonal way. Uh, where they try to develop detachment or renunciation. But actually they can't maintain their renunciation. They can't maintain their detachment. They keep falling down. Huh? We see this again and again, that when they try to simply withdraw from the material changes, because huh? everybody's suffering because of these material changes. So they try to withdraw from the material changes into some artificial mental construct of spiritual life as being uh, impersonal, different from matter. But wait a minute, what's so different? Matter is impersonal too. Huh? If I try to talk to this chair, hey chair, what's up? I'm not going to get much of a response. Uh, to have communication, to have a relationship, you have to have a person. It's awfully lonely in that impersonal space. Uh, that's because it's an artificial construct. In the material world, we see life everywhere. You walk out the door, of course, we, we make these artificial environments for human habitation where there is less life. But as soon as you walk out the door, there's birds and animals and trees and grass and insects and stuff going on everywhere. Life finds a niche wherever it can survive. Huh? Even under the, under the ice cap in the, the Antarctica, there's living things, bacteria. Some of them have been frozen for thousands of years. And when they bring them up from under the ice, they can revive them. Huh? So life is everywhere, even in the most hosp inhospitable places. Huh? So what to speak of in a normal place like this? Uh, life is everywhere. So if you think, the, 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 if uh, life is everywhere in the material world, and you go to the spiritual world and everything's dead, what kind of spiritual world is that? It's nonsense. How can this world, which is full of life, come from a spiritual world that's impersonal and dead? It's not possible. I mean, there are unlimited arguments against the impersonal point of view. Unlimited. Uh, for every argument they make, we can make ten arguments against it. Try to understand. Real spiritual life means, first of all, I am a spirit soul. I am a person. I have an identity. I have individuality. I have consciousness. I have feelings. I have all kinds of qualities that belong to a person. So if I have those qualities, what to speak of God? God must have all those qualities and more. Huh? Many, many more qualities. And he must have those qualities 
in unlimited abundance. My qualities are limited. Our qualities, because we're simply sparks of God. Uh, parts and parcels, atomic fragments. <laughs> and as soon as we realize that, then we put ourselves in relation with the Supreme Person. And this is our normal condition of spiritual life. In material consciousness, we're in a diseased condition because we're identifying with a material body and mind. Uh, because of this, we become subject to all the changes in the material world, driven by time. But in the spiritual world, we come into eternity. Eternity is a higher dimension of time where there's no change, there's no beginning or end, there's no birth or death, there's no suffering, there's no imperfection, no ignorance. Uh, try to understand. Real spiritual life means the end of suffering. If someone is suffering, in fact, in the Nectar of Devotion we've been studying, early on, I think it's in the fifth chapter, Rupa Goswami says that uh, Relief from material suffering is the first result. It's the first thing. Please don't wiggle the camera. Christian, don't wiggle the camera. Yeah. It's the first thing, the first result that we get from devotional service. Huh? So, what to speak of the other results, huh, which are even better? Relief from suffering is, is not considered a very big thing. It's just a preliminary result of the, the neophyte stage of devotional service. But what to speak of the topmost perfect stage of devotional service? So, try to understand how wonderful, how powerful how potent this process is. This is so, it's such a powerful process that we can actually influence God. A uh, hundred years ago, my spiritual master's, spiritual master's, spiritual master's, spiritual master said that this Western civilization is not at all good. I think it should be destroyed. And now it's happening. Now it's happening. And over the next year or two, you'll see it's going to fall completely apart. And something else will take its place. Spontaneous, self-organizing, distributed, decentralized communities based on local agriculture, local agricultural production. This is the wave of the future. Uh, we're going back to village life, back to the village model. No more of these big multinational corporations and soul-sucking factories and uh, cheating banks and Wall Street and all this. It's all going away. Why? Because its karma has finally caught up with it. They've created so much bad karma. Uh, first of all, they're killing cows. And just because of this alone, that would be enough to destroy their society. The cow should never be killed. And then beyond that, they're cheating, they're lying. Politics, uh, bad financial deals and so many things. All this is going to come out this summer. All these secrets are going to come out. How they knew that this would actually result in a financial meltdown. And they did it anyway just to get a few extra bucks. Oh, people are going to be so angry. But we don't need to get caught up in this, but we should know that it's going to happen. We should expect it. It's the law of nature, the law of God, that it's going to happen. It's got to happen. Uh, because why? The devotees wanted it to happen. The devotees were seeing Oh, this impersonal philosophy, this materialist philosophy, atheistic philosophy, uh, so-called science and all this nonsense, 
is being spread all over the place. Oh, by the way, another thing that's going to happen is that the whole edifice of modern science is going to be discredited by new discoveries. Wait till you see. It's going to be so much fun. It's going to really be cool to see all these lies and all these politics and all these abuses finally stopped. But of course, what it means is that there's going to be a, a period of tremendous revolution. And people aren't ready for that. Huh? They think, oh, I believe in this and this and that. And if it changes, then I just won't know what to do. They won't know what to do. They don't see it coming. Huh? They're going to be like blindsided. Uh, we see it all coming. Why? Because our gurus are actually the cause of it. The devotees are actually the cause of it. Huh? I'm making a big claim here. <laughs> the guru is God's revelation.